I loved this book. And I loved what Elif Bautman, someone who is much more eloquent than I, had to say about it. She says, It's not every day you come across a genuinely page-turning kidnapping story that is also replete with historical, psychological, and interpretive insights into Maimonides, envy, and motherhood, not to mention replicating the narrative structure and central themes of the biblical story of Joseph. A Guide for the Perplexed is Dara Horn's most ambitious, audacious, edifying, and entertaining novel yet. I couldn't agree more. Dara is the author of four novels, and she was chosen by Granta Magazine as one of America's best young American novelists, and two of her books have won the National Jewish Book Award. Please join me in welcoming her back to Politics and Prose. I want to thank uh, I want to thank everyone at uh, Politics and Prose for inviting me back here. It's a pleasure to be here, um, and I want to thank all of you for coming. You heard a little bit about my uh, my life or my work just now, but what you didn't hear is the more salient feature of my of my daily life, which is that um, in addition to writing these books, I'm also the mother of an eight year old, a six year old, a four year old and a one-year-old. So it's really rare that anyone in my house actually listens to me. So I want to say thank you in advance to all of you for listening to what I have to say, because no one listens to me at home. Since I was a child, I've had a kind of a fantasy of turning life into an archive, of writing everything down so that nothing would ever be lost. Now, of course, social media has made my dream come true and turned it into a nightmare where every idiotic thing you ever do is recorded forever. I think we like, often like to think of this information overload as a, an extremely modern problem. But I, as one thing that you didn't hear about me is that in addition to writing these novels, I'm also a professional nerd. And what I mean by that is uh, I, I, I moonlight as a professor of Hebrew and Yiddish literature. So because of my status as a professional nerd, I know that this question of data dumping has actually happened before. In 1897, there was a Cambridge professor named Solomon Schechter who discovered a trove of medieval documents in a 900-year-old synagogue in Cairo. Because of a religious law against destroying any piece of paper that had God's name on it, this synagogue, like a lot of, uh, like a lot of synagogues to this day, had a, a, what's called a geniza, which is a hide, it's, it literally means a hiding place. Like uh, it was a repository for books or documents that were damaged and couldn't be used anymore, but that they couldn't throw away. Unlike most communities, the Jews of Cairo were saving not only sacred writings, but also anything that was written in Hebrew letters. And also, unlike most communities, they had not bothered to empty this geniza in 900 years. So when Schechter opened this second story hatch leading to this geniza, he looked down into this cloud of dust. And underneath this dust was a well of loose paper that was more than 20 feet deep. You know, and Schechter, remember, was a was was a professor at Cambridge, um, and was therefore, of course, a British, uh, an agent of the British Empire, and because of that, he, of course, in typical British imperial fashion, took all of these documents, packed them all up, and brought, you know, paid off the locals some token amount, and then brought all these documents back to Cambridge. Some of these things turned out to be priceless literary treasures, or first drafts of famous philosophical works, or um, poetry by world class talent, this kind of thing, but. The reality of this stash of documents of this Cairo Geniza is that most of it was things like sales receipts, business inventories, grocery lists, medical prescriptions, recipes, um, notes with timeless words such as, please don't spank my child for being late. His homework delayed him. So this was the kind of like typical trash that you found here. This was not an archive. This was actually what I would call the medieval Facebook. It was crammed with so much mundane junk that it would actually be possible to reconstruct an entire world from it, except that 100 years later, it is, it's barely been cataloged. 
because of the enormous volume of, of information that was in this. It's only now that finally all of the information has finally been cataloged by the libraries that now own it. So it was in looking at this ancient trove of documents and thinking about what we save and why we save it that I first started embarking on the project that became this book. This is a book that you can judge by its cover. It is a book within a book within a book. And I did not design this cover, but I'm very grateful to the person who did, who is far more talented than I am. Um, this, so it is a story within a story within another story. On the outside, the out outermost story of this book, it's about a woman who invents the next generation of social media. It's a platform that records everything its users do and catalogs all those things according to their instincts. Those of you who have read my other books know that I'm a little bit obsessed with injecting forgotten history into a plot worthy of an airport novel. So that's the reason that this particular software developer ends up getting kidnapped in post-revolutionary Egypt. Because like, why wouldn't she be kidnapped in post-revolutionary Egypt? That makes this possibly the one of the, I don't know if it's the first, but one of the, one of the first uh, American novels about the Arab Spring which is mainly because I started writing it before the Arab Spring and then I had to change my plot. <laughs> but, and then of course I was annoyed when the Egyptians overthrew their dictator because it was gonna mess up my, my, uh, the entire plan I had for this book. But it also meant that I suddenly had this chance to write about a, a really astonishing moment where one of the world's oldest civilizations was suddenly forced to face an entirely new situation where suddenly everything was on the record. Part of this book takes place in the Library of Alexandria, which you might remember from fourth grade social studies as the largest library in the ancient world. But what you probably did not learn in fourth grade social studies is that the Library of Alexandria was actually rebuilt 10 years ago as a $200 million complex. And it actually contains one of the world's, actually it's the world's only backup of the internet archive. The Internet Archive being the record of every web page that's ever been created since the early 90s. The original backup, the original of the Internet Archive is in Silicon Valley, and the backup, the only backup, is at the Library of Alexandria in Egypt. Um, to me, this is sort of like how the pharaohs had to be buried with all of their organs perfectly preserved. Yeah. It's like this is something they're good at, and uh, it's, you know, today nobody believes that you can't take it with you. But the story inside the kidnapping plot as you heard from uh, the introduction, is inspired by the biblical story of Joseph and his brothers, which is retold in modern times and with women instead of men. I think it's very important that some of the oldest stories in the world are about sibling rivalry. Not because it's true that mom loved you best, although maybe in your personal case it is true that mom loved you best, but, but because I feel that siblings are people who usually share a past but not necessarily a future. And because of that difference in, what they, in the way they remember their past and the way they interpret their future, it's almost like a capsule view of the power of memory in, chain, in altering, in a sense, in altering what's happened in our pasts. Sibling relationships are something that I'm very familiar with, not only from my own children, but also because I have two sisters who are also published writers and a brother who just won his second Emmy. When we were children, the four of us liked to torture our parents at the dinner table by talking endlessly about our days, and no one would ever, you know, it's saying it to telling our parents all about what happened at school. No one would ever let anyone else finish a sentence. We were all talking over each other. And one day, our mother got so frustrated with this that she came home from work with a big kitchen timer. And she set this timer on the table and she said, From now on, each child will have five minutes to tell about his or her day. And anyone who interrupts that child will have time deducted. Well, there were several results of this policy, one of which is that I now speak very quickly. So I apologize if your ears have trouble keeping up with my mouth. This is entirely my mother's fault. <laughs> but and another result of this policy is that this quickly became a competitive sport. And my siblings were not going to put up with this idea that they couldn't offer their constant running commentary on what they felt about what, uh, you know, how, how, how entertaining they found your day. So... One of my sisters solved this problem by passing out pencils and index cards to everyone at the table. And people would then write down numbers on the card and hold them up while you were speaking, rating your day. 
You know, sort of like your day gets a 2.3, your day gets a negative 5, kind of like at the Olympics. And, you know, I think that when people are holding up cards in your face with numbers that are saying your day stinks, it makes you very aware of what it means to tell a story and keep an audience engaged. So as a result, I think dinner soon turned into a series of five-minute operas, five-minute comedies, five-minute tragedies. It was sort of like this ongoing five-minute gong show. And at those dinners, my brother and sisters gave me a kind of answer to the question of what happens to days that disappear. If you're unlucky, they get dumped in a storage room in Cairo or in, on an NSA server, as it turns out is happening to all of our days. If you're lucky, they turn into stories. The Jews of medieval Cairo had an excuse for saving everything in their lives. They believed that their language was infused with a kind of holiness. The NSA also says that it has an excuse, whether you accept it or not. But my question for all of us is, what's our excuse? Do we, other than narcissism, do we have a reason for Instagramming every instant of our lives? And, and what is it about saving everything in our lives that we find not just so compelling, but also so necessary? My own theory is that it's a fear of mortality. I think uh, the Egyptian pharaohs once filled their tombs with statues and images and texts that were sort of meant to represent everything that they wanted to carry over from this world to the next world. And I think that we very similarly hope that if we could just save everything in that kind of way, that all of our momentary encounters will somehow remain with us. So you know how people always are taking pictures of meals and posting them on Facebook and Twitter? So I mean, this is that kind of thing. I think you t they post pictures of the delicious dinner that soon will become a pile of dirty dishes. Um, the, the sunset that's going to fade into darkness, the, the man or woman who's soon going to leave you for somebody else, um, the smiling parent who's going to pass away, the crawling baby who's going to grow up. We have this idea that if we save these things somehow or save images or, or, or records of these things, that somehow all of them will remain forever unchanging, sort of stored in some way in it for eternity in some metaphysical space beyond time, which I feel is why we call it the cloud. But I think that what's lost in that cloud is the art of forgetting. The selective memory that distinguishes trash from treasure. My parents spent 30 years as avid snapshot takers. Notice I said avid, not good. That they took, spent many years as snapshot takers. And, and in our house, there's this whole floor to ceiling bookshelf that is, has all of the photo albums that they've recorded of, of our, family's, our family's life. But recently I realized that if my husband and I were to print up all the photos that we have of our own children's lives, they would easily fill a room, which maybe wouldn't be a problem except that our oldest child is only eight years old. <laughs> and it, what, it, what this makes me often wonder about is the, the possibility that saving everything may in fact be the same as saving nothing. Because in sheer quantity of data, so many of our personal lives in a sense, be start to resemble that room in Cairo. They become kind of these bottomless wells of trivial information with their treasures concealed in a cloud. This book is called A Guide for the Perplexed. And as probably many people here know, I've, I've borrowed this title rather flagrant, flagrant, flagrantly from uh, the famous book Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides, a 12th century philosopher. And this was a philosopher whose rough drafts of this book were found in that storage room in Cairo. The author of the original Guide for the Perplexed, Moses Maimonides, was a scientist. He was a scholar. And he also was the chief surgeon to the Sultan of Egypt in the, tw in the 12th century when he lived. And in his time, Egypt was the tech capital of the world. It was on the cutting edge of science. It was at the crossroads of a global economy. And in his book, he asks the same question that so many of us are still asking now. The question to me is, are our lives determined by forces that we can't control? Or do we have the free will to determine our future? And this used to be, in a sense, a religious question, because it used to be that the question was whether we have free will as human agents or is God controlling our lives through some predestined plan. But what I want to 
to emphasize is that that question is very much still alive today, even for people who are living secular lives. And the reason for that is because now the question of predetermination or predestination comes from another source. It comes from our faith in, our faith in science. Um, you can have this belief that your life is predestined through genetics or that your life is predestined through brain chemistry or through hormones or through any kind of physical laws. So the question, it is a very open question, how much of our lives is determined by free will and how much is determined by circumstances beyond our control. Do we have have the free will to control our future. Of course, as anyone with children knows, we don't have the ability to control our future or anyone else's. Um, and I have all kinds of unpleasant examples I can give you from my own house to illustrate that. Um, but I do think that there is a superpower that we do have, which is the ability to control the past. And what I mean by that is not that we can change the past, but that the way that we can control the past is not by recording everything but by curating our memories, by deciding and choosing out of that bottomless well of information what's worth remembering, what's worth bringing up to the surface and, and giving meaning to it in the future. And I think it's that act of choosing what's worth remembering that turns a lifetime's worth of memories into a story. In bookstores, they always like you to read from the book. Um, and, uh, and I remember the first time I ever did this with my first book, and I would look out and I was like, it's so sad that all these adults never learned how to read. <laughs> but I know that this is part of the tradition of bookstore readings, and so I am going to read to you from the book. Um, but just a few, a few passages so we can have a, a more of a conversation. Um, the first thing I'm going to read is right from the very beginning of the book. It explains a little about this Geniza software that my main character, Josie Ashkenazi, has created. It explains a little bit about how it works and uh, starts to hint at what the implications for that might be. What happens to days that disappear? The light fades, the gates begin to close, and all that a day once held, a glance, a fight, a taste of bread, a handful of braided hair, thousands of worries and triumphs and regrets, all of it slips between those closing gates, vanishing into a dark and silent room. When Josephine Ashkenazi first invented Geniza, all she wanted to do was open those gates. At least that was how it started. In its earliest versions, the program that Josie invented was little more than a variant on dozens of others. But then the software grew, unfolding before her like a prophetic dream. By the time she was 24, Geniza was a vast platform that saved not only material that its users deliberately created, but essentially everything else they did too, cataloging worlds of data according to the user's habits. By the time she was 26, Geniza didn't merely store data, but tracked it, showing past trajectories and using them to predict the user's future. By the time she was 27, she had married the company's chief engineer, had been the subject of a nationally televised documentary, and had had a baby. By the time she was 33, her six-year-old daughter's to daughter Tali's every moment was recorded forever. But Tali knew nothing about it until one morning when, almost by accident, Josie showed her the archive of her life. I can't find my shoes, Mommy, Tali had announced at breakfast. I looked and looked, but they're nowhere. That's impossible, Josie told her. They're somewhere, probably somewhere obvious. Where did you take them off yesterday? I don't remember, Tolly said, losing interest. She was dressed, as always, entirely in orange, which she claimed was for safety. Now she was dipping the ends of her hair into milk, painting the table white. Josie scaled the stairs and quickly glanced around Tolly's bedroom, checked her closet, dropped to the floor to check under her bed, returned downstairs to look in the kitchen and then by the TV. To Josie's chagrin, Tolly seemed to be correct. The shoes were nowhere. Now I can't go to school, Tolly proclaimed. Josie sucked in her breath. She stepped to the kitchen counter and grabbed her tablet, entering passwords with a few quick taps. Under local panoramic search, she typed in Tolly, then shoes. In an instant, an image appeared of Tolly's new sneakers, mid-drop, as they descended from Tolly's feet to the floor of Josie's car. There they are, Josie said, and tipped the screen toward Tolly. You must have taken them off on the way home. Tolly gaped and then ran to the garage. Josie followed Tolly and watched as her daughter's eyes bulged at the sight of the shoes on the car's floor. Tolly shoved her sneakers on and then climbed into the seat, still gaping. How did you do that? Tolly asked. 
Josie took the tablet out of her bag and turned it toward her daughter. I have everything from your wife in here, she said. That picture was pulled off the camera on my phone from when the phone was in that holder between the seats facing you. Tolly was baffled. How did the camera know to take a picture? It happens automatically, Josie said. The camera's running all the time. Then the pictures get saved in a... in a program that I made that collects everything and sorts it. She was surprised by how difficult this was to explain to someone who was six years old. She pointed to the screen. Anything you ever want to remember, it's here. Tolly stared at the screen, stunned. Her dark hair shone in the car's dim interior light. Really? Like what? Like everything, Josie said. Here's what happens when I search for your shoes, for instance. She tapped in keywords as images of doors flashed on the screen, little animated doors opening to reveal hundreds of photos and video clips. See, these are the first shoes you ever wore when you were about a year old. Josie looked at the picture and felt a sudden shiver as she saw her daughter at 11 months old, balancing on unsteady legs. Was that fat little baby the same person as the stringy six-year-old who was now staring at the screen? How is it possible? Josie shook away the thought and tapped out more words on the screen, silencing the breath of eternity over her shoulder. And here's where we bought you those shoes last week, she said. When you got mad at me, Tolly muttered. Josie frowned. She hadn't remembered that, though now it occurred to her that the shopping trip had been unpleasant, that she had been distracted by a message from her office, and Tolly, in a bid for her attention, had knocked over a large cardboard display case, sending sneakers flying across the store. Josie returned the tablet to her bag and slid into the driver's seat, unsettled. Is everything from when you were little in there too? Tolly asked. No, actually, Josie admitted. I hadn't invented it yet then. Lucky you, Tolly said. Josie paused. Lucky? Why? Because you get to remember everything the way you want, instead of how it really happened. So that's from the opening of the book. I'm going to read to you um, a section from when Solomon Schechter uh, discovers the Geniza, this, uh, this well of documents that he finds in this uh, synagogue in Cairo. He's had all kinds of negotiations with the chief rabbi of the synagogue in order to get there. And now he finally is uh, being uh, invited in to find out, to, to take a look at what this place really is. The rabbi leaned a rotting wooden ladder against a high, decrepit wall. The ladder hit the wall just beneath a large rectangle of dark fi filth, sending chunks of plaster raining down to the floor. The rabbi and the custodian looked at Schechter for a long moment in silence. Schechter waited for either of them to speak, but the two of them kept staring at him until the rabbi waved a hand at the ladder. So are you going up? The rabbi asked. The ladder clearly led nowhere. Was this some sort of trick? Up where? Schechter asked. Inside, the rabbi said. Now Schechter looked up again to where the ladder had touched the wall and saw that the dark rectangle at the top, which he had thought was just a patch of soot-covered plaster, was actually a small wooden door. What you're looking for is there, the rabbi said, pointing to the top. Climb! The custodian offered him a lantern, which he lit with a match from his pocket. Still skeptical, Schechter took the lamp and climbed. The door was half the size of a normal door, like a cupboard. With one firm push, Schechter pushed the door inward and lifted his body off the ladder until he was sitting on the threshold, with his legs swinging into the room. To his surprise, there was no floor. His legs were dangling in dark space. Then his foot brushed against something, something that made a loud, crunching sound. An enormous cloud of dust blew into his face. Schechter coughed and held up the lamp in front of him. When the clouds cleared, he saw below him a sea of paper. He had expected a room full of shelves or cabinets or drawers, a kind of morgue for books. But this was an ocean, or considering the narrow dimensions of the room, more like a well. Papers filled the entire narrow room up to the height of the building's second floor, rising up in a heap like a swell of a wave near the threshold of the door where the most recent corpses had been dumped. In places, he could make out whole books bound in leather, but most of it, the bulk of that thick and heavy sea, was loose paper. He lowered himself down until he was actually standing in the papers, supported by parchment several feet below him and still well, love, well above the level of the floor outside. He was immersed in paper up to his waist. 
and perching the lash lantern on the threshold of the door, hardly thinking about fire or anything else, he began to read. The first paper he saw near his right sleeve was a marriage contract. He picked it up and read the first lines, which announced that the wedding ceremony between David, the son of Abraham, and Miriam, the daughter of Joseph, had taken place in Fustat, now old Cairo, on a Tuesday, on the 15th of the month of Av, 957 years before. He lifted it out of the pile and imagined this young couple suddenly feeling their presence in the room. On the back of the parchment, he found another paper stuck to the first. It was a bill of divorce for David, the son of Abraham, and Miriam, the daughter of Joseph, whose marriage had apparently been dissolved in Fustat on a Wednesday on the 8th of the month of Elul, 10 years later. Schechter shuddered, breathing in more dust. Near his other arm, he saw a dark paper with large letters. As he lifted it, he saw that the letters were litted, written in repeated rows in an awkward hand. The letters Kaf and Lamed scrawled again and again. Some little child hundreds of years ago had been learning how to write. Stuck to the child's page was a paper written in much smaller adult letters, a passage so disintegrated that Schechter could only make out a few of the words, which read, and if anyone believes in the existence of demons, that person has sinned against the Holy One and shall be forgotten for all eternity. And there the page was torn. Schechter reached to adjust the lamp, broadening the light. As he moved, he noticed a parchment near the doorway with letters arranged in careful squares. He picked it up and read the neat, emphatic words beneath the box letters. May this spell destroy the demons who have possessed Miss Yair so, sh so that she may love me for all eternity. Schechter looked around at the fathomless pit of paper. The air in the room was alive, trembling with the thoughts of thousands of people whose names were inscribed in the parchments below. He sifted the papers before him, lifting them like sand and letting them slide between his fingers. In some dark closet of his mind, Schechter heard a voice, a voice so distant and so irrelevant that it took him several seconds to realize that it was the rabbis. The shout echoed toward him from beyond the well. Is this the garbage you want? Schechter placed the paper he was holding aside, but there was no aside. It was all a well, a deep and bottomless well of lives, the lives of everyone who had left a name and everyone who had perished as though they had never lived. Schechter tried to speak, coughed, choked, tried again. Yes, he shouted. Then perhaps we can come to an agreement, the rabbi called back. Schechter stared at the papers below him, thought of the money Professor Taylor had given him, calculated what he had left, calculated what he might need, Suddenly, money seemed irrelevant. He was dipping his feet into eternity. But the rabbi below wanted an answer, and he was the one holding the ladder. <laughs> I can offer you 300 pounds sterling for it, Schechter boarded. 300 pounds? Was he insane? It was more than four years worth of rent on his house in Cambridge. But what else was money for if not for this? Somewhere outside the hole in the wall, Schechter heard a sudden gasp and then loud laughter. When the laughter finally faded, he heard the rabbi call out in a, bright to in a bright tone, Take whatever you like! As a matter of fact, Schechter liked it all. I'm going to read you just one more page. Um, this is a page, a lot of the book, as I mentioned, the book is very much drawn from the biblical story of Joseph, and it's about the rivalry between these two siblings, in this case, two sisters. Um, and a lot of the book is from the point of view of this other sister who, in, in a sense, feels that, you know, she has this sibling who's had this amazing life of tremendous achievement, but she feels that she's always lived in that shadow. And this section I'm reading is just um, a, a, something from her point of view. This is what Judith would like to forget. A girl in a bathtub, her breath hovering over the face of the water. In this memory, Judith is four years old, and she's blowing bubbles enraptured by how the soap-skinned bathwater bulges by her breath alone into a primal ooze. She raises her head to take another breath, and then she notices her reflection. Her face appears on the faucet's shiny surface, her wide gums and stumpy baby teeth sliding into focus. Now she can see the whole bathroom reflected in the faucet, curled into a perfect orb like a baby bird enfolded in an egg. In the miniature world contained within the faucet's circle, she can see her little sister Josie standing on a step stool by the sink and her mother brushing Josie's dark wet hair. And now Judith watches with absolute reverence as her mother turns her sister's hair into a long dark braid. On the curved surface, surface of the bathtub faucet, Judith sees her mother holding a new striped bathrobe and wrapping it around her sister. Three-year-old Josie's face is glowing above the bathrobe's colors 
resplendent in the room's primordial light. Her mother bends down to Josie's little face. And then Judith hears her mother whisper to her sister, Josie, I love you best of all. This is the beginning, Judith's first memory, and nothing else matters. All of the worlds before that moment might as well never have existed. Thank you for listening, because no one listens to me at home. <laughs> Please stop me if you've already talked about this stuff, but because uh, I came in about 10 minutes late. Um, if I remember correctly, I re I've read all of your books before this one, and I love them. Um, and I remember when I read your first book that at that point, I think you were a grad student in comp lit, and you were doing some of the... So I'm a historian, and with a sort of ambivalent relationship with academia, but I have dabbled a little bit in the Cairo Geniza, partially once as an undergraduate and then a couple weeks ago at a seminar where um, a scholar was showing us a work in progress in which she was trying to reconstruct women's lives and divorce rates and marriage rates and so on from the documents that are in there. And so what you just said about the poignancy and the, the, the stresses that um, were faced by the person who was first going through the Geniza made me wonder, though, from a sort of more a later perspective, whether that abundance of sources is not, in fact, the kind of, how you you think through, in the context of this book, the tension between scholarship from a, you know, a future age that depends so deeply on being able to reconstruct through these accidental pieces a whole world that has vanished and the issues of memory and you know life today that we're talking about and i just wondered if that tied in at all with your own you know relationship as both a novelist and as somebody who has had a scholarly career sure um a historian who writes about this a lot um, is the late um, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, mm -hmm. um, who has a book called uh, Zachor, which is the Hebrew word for remember. Um, and he talks about the difference between memory and history. And this is, of course, you, know, you and other people who, you know, there's people who know a lot more about this than I do. And I, you know, and certainly you know more, more about this than I do. But um, the difference, at least in a layman's terms, is that, you know, is that history is is arrived at through examining evidence and 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 you know, interpreting that evidence um, in a way that is at least supposed to be objective or at least there is and there's an attempt at objectivity although that of course is something that you know you know more about than I do and obviously I would imagine that all, all I mean objectivity is impossible. Well, it's always partial. But yes. You capture something that is vanished. Yes. Otherwise. There's an attempt to yes, but I think that um, but whereas memory is something very different. Memory is. A story that you have constructed um, about the past, which may or may not correlate with the history or the evidence of the past, and to me, that that's very much a central theme of the book because um, what what this software developer has done, in a sense, and what I think is very much similar to the world we're living in now, is she's replaced personal memory with history, with evidence, with collections of evidence. So it's sort of become impossible to, um, you know, in a sense, it's become impossible to create your own story. And this is something that I think about a lot, um, just in our the way we live our personal lives. I'm 36 years old, um, so I'm not that old, but I'm old enough that my, my entire life is not recorded online. And what I, I often sort of feel sorry for people who are younger than me because because for a lot of reasons, but for one of the reasons is that because they'll never have a chance to meet a stranger. And what I mean by that is they'll never sort of, you know, go on a date and have that person and be able to sort of tell their story to that person and have them not already know a lot of other things about them that they maybe couldn't even have controlled the person knowing. Um, and they'll never sort of go to a job interview and make a first impression at a job interview, right? I mean, they'll, they'll never have those, you know, they'll never meet a, a new friend or a new roommate and sort of be able to tell their story in the way that they want to tell their story for that person. They won't have that opportunity because of this sort of replacement of, per, of history with memory in a sense that's sort of become very accepted with the technology. Technology. So that's something, but and at the same time, that's also um, it's also a very old problem. Um, there's one of the dialogues of Plato is called Phaedrus, and it's about Socrates talking about how technology has changed memory because now that we have this new technology called writing, 
no one will ever have to remember anything anymore because who's going to need to memorize Homer when they can just write it down? And, you know, memory is the core of the soul. And if we don't have that core of the soul that's telling those stories and remembering those things, then who are we and what will be the meaning of our lives now that we can write everything down? So, I mean, this is a very old problem. Um, and we, we flatter ourselves by saying that everything happens to us is unprecedented. Um, in terms of the question that you asked me about sort of my work as a scholar versus a novelist, um, it is something that I think about a lot because I am very much put in that situation, especially in a book like this where I'm drawing from historical sources to write the book. Um, what I'm aware of is sort of the degree to which even her historians who aspire to be objective in a sense can't be, um, because you're always curating the past. Um, you're always selecting what you want to use from the past. Um, and in a sense, that, that kind of selection is what allows for an understanding of who we are um, and, and allows us to create a future. Um, I talked about the story of Joseph. In the biblical story of Joseph, Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery, and, of, you know, and, and they when he's, they, he later encounters them when they come to Egypt to buy food and he's through a bunch of circumstances which I won't bother to explain, he's become in charge of this rationing project, pro program in Egypt. When his brothers re-encounter him in Egypt, you think, and he confronts them, you think this would be the opportunity for him to be like, you know, you jerks, <laughs> right? You ruined my life. Um, what he says to them is, do not be angry at yourselves that you sold me to this place because it was to save life that God sent me ahead of you. I mean, to me, this is like a mind-blowing revision of the past, right? I mean, it's like, how can you say that this, you know, the heinous crime that these people committed against you, oh, actually, that was a benevolent act of God. I mean, it, this is like uh, absurd. Um, but what I think it's, in its absurdity, it, I think it captures the, the reality that there can't be the fiction, uh, f forgiveness is only possible in a sense as, as a kind of fiction that fi the forgiveness is not possible without forgetting. And it's it, in a sense, he has to say something like that in order for this family to have a future. There isn't a way, you need to find a way to, to, to understand the past. And that's what I mean when I said, when I talked about controlling the past, we do control the past, not because we can change what's happened in the past, but, but we can change how we understand it, how we choose to understand the things that happened in the past. And that's something that, we, that I do as a storyteller and, and truthfully, all scholars are storytellers too, at least in the humanities, maybe in other fields too. Thank other you. yeah thank you other questions um <clears throat> hi hi um uh we're here with my husband tonight and we're both big fans of your books um we actually read uh all other nights while i was pregnant and our son wound up being named jacob we were leaving there anyway but it sealed the deal because we thought it was a beautiful <laughs> story um my question for you is uh, you know, the way that you knit this amazing amount of history into the, your books. I mean, I always, you know, I f even before I finish the book, I'm looking stuff up. I'm, you know, <laughs> things that I don't necessarily know a lot about, periods of history. How do you, I guess, nitty gritty, how do you, how, what is your process in terms of research? And then um, in terms of your, you know, imagination and desire to tell a story, how do you weave truth and you know, into fiction and how do you, I mean, it's beautiful the way you do it. And I just, I'm curious to see how you view it and when do you stop researching? Because that's always really hard. <laughs> sure. Um, well, I think uh, in a sense, you're, you're, a lot of people ask me this question and then I think that they come to the question with the assumption that I sort of sit down and I decide what I'm going to write about and I do a lot of research and then I write the book and that's, that's not, it's sort of the opposite order. Um, I don't plan my novels at all which is evidenced by the fact that my, I usually start with about 100 or 200 pages that I throw away. Um, and it's very sad, and I can't. there's nothing I can do with those. And people always say, oh, why don't you write that for your next book? And it's like, well, if it wasn't good enough for this book, why would it be good enough for the next book, right? Like, it wasn't good enough. That's why it's in the garbage um, or in the Geniza. Um, so um, I, I, start, I started this novel. I mean, I, I write them all for different reasons. And the last book was a, to a totally historical book, so that's a little bit of a different process. But with this book, um, I wanted to write a contemporary story. I was really sort of like, I'd written my last book, the one that she mentioned, is about uh, Civil War spies. And so I kind of had it up to here with like history. And, and then like, you know, people were like showing up in costumes to my readings. And like, you know, it was like, it was just very, I mean, it was fun. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was like very goofy, but uh, and it was fun. And like, you know, and I got to be like, you know, the, the, the Civil War buffs, like, you know, they, they really attack you, like when you get, if you do anything, that's like a little bit off. But then it was like, I became a Civil War buff in the process, which was like horrifying. Like, I remember somebody writing to me and saying something like, Judah Benjamin, it says in your book that he was this Jewish Secretary of uh, State for the Confederacy. And it, they said, it says in your book that he was a British citizen because he was born in the British West Indies, but really he was born on the island of St. Croix. And that was in the Danish West Indies. 
And I'm like, and I actually got to the point where I was able to write back and I said, well, actually, Judah Benjamin was born on the island of St. Croix during the month when it was under British occupation. And I'm like, wow, I've become one of them. And I'm like, I have to stop. I'm like, I have to, I, I can't do this anymore. And so I had this idea with this book that I was going to write an entirely contemporary book. And I mean, that's why I started with this, you know, it's like hyper contemporary, it's software development. It's like something that doesn't even exist yet, right? It's like future. Um, but then what happened was in the process of writing this story, I realized that in a sense, I... I was drawn back to the past. And what I mean by that is that because I, as, it, as it became clear to me that I was writing about this idea of memory and how it works, um, that in a sense I needed to test my idea about how we remember the past. And I needed to test it against something more consequential than you know, some one person's childhood or something like that. I needed it to be a more of a communal past and something that had more import. So that was when I started then looking back at the, at the material. And so, I mean, it's sort of, it's, it's kind of an, an organic thing in that like, I'm, I'm not writing the book, I'm writing the book the same way you would read it. Like I'm writing it to like find out what happens next. Like I don't know that like, oh, this next part's gonna be about Solomon Schechter. Like that's news to me. Um, you know, and I don't know, like, like there's a chapter very late in this book that's from the perspective of Maimonides. That was like, I remember edging in on that and thinking like, I'm gonna have to do this. And I'm like, oh, I don't wanna do this. And I'm like, should I do this? And it was like this agonizing thing. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll do it, <laughs> right? Um, and then it ended up saying in the book, which, you know, other things did not. There was a lot of stuff that got cut out of this book. So there was, aren't you glad that I cut the whole chapter about string theory? <laughs> You're really glad, aren't you? Um, that was really, yeah, that was not, I'm glad I got rid of that. Um, so, but I do the research really as I go. Um, and in a sense, I'm re, um, I use it as a way to find out what's going to happen next, to find out what could happen next. Because um, one thing about the history is it's not like there's this set of facts. It's like there's many sets of facts and there's a lot that you can draw from. I could have written an entirely different book about the Hierogeniza, about some other historian or something like that. Um, but you know, I made choices, and when when I found, when I, I would do a lot of reading, and then when I found something that was appropriate to the book, that's what I would focus on. So, for example, I discovered that Solomon Schechter um, found out this information about the Geiroganiza from these two widowed Presbyterian identical twin sisters, um, who had been to Egypt, had discovered the first uh, the first edition of the Gospels, which is just like the Gospel we know today, except that there's no virgin birth and there's no resurrection. So they became like world famous for this, right? So this was and that these are two identical twins, and then I discovered that Schechter also coincidentally had been an was an identical twin, um, and you know the sibling theme had become important in the book. And then as I started reading about Maimonides, I found that he had had this. Uh, uh, very elaborate, you know, there's a lot of, a fair amount of documentation about his relationship with his brother. And he had this, had really sunken into mourning for his brother when his brother died in the, um, in, drowned in the Indian Ocean. Um, so these were sort of like when you find those facts, that became like those kernels of information that were relevant to what I was doing were what I chose to include in the story. I mean, I could have written something entirely different. And, and it is important to me that it be that it be accurate as, as, as accurate as it can be. Of course, you always have to invent when you're writing fiction. I mean, you know, there's no documents of their conversations. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I, it, it's important to me to like, you know, that he was, you know, born in, under British occupation. Like those kind of, you know, like I'm a dork and, you know, I, I, I care about those details. So I try to include those things. And then also, I, you know, I mean, I, there, I put a little note in the back because I feel like there are people who want to know like what's true, what's not true in this book. Um, so, I mean, that's sort of probably part of my academic heritage is that I feel the need to include that in a sense. I'm probably, um, you know, I, I, that makes me more loyal to the facts than I probably otherwise would be. Okay. My hope is that uh, you will continue writing after you decide to not have any more children. <laughs> Since, well, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I found as opposed to all other nights where there's a lot in the way you structured, structured the book from a literary perspective that hearing you speak really opens up your eyes a lot more. This is um, the, the multiply tiered stories that are more complex and you can research on as an individual, but the, but the basic nuggets are there for the reader. Um, I think that that's a different way, but it may be at times a little bit off-putting to people who go, well, I'm totally ignorant about what a Geniza is and, and all these other things. Um, I wonder if that was an intentional decision in terms of revealing the information so that they could really move along, see what you were getting at without having to um, plumb literary structure, I guess is what it is. So your question, just to make sure I understand and I'm answering the right question, your question is about um, the decision to incorporate different 
plot lines, or the question is about the his, the information that's the included? The underlying structure. In um, All Other Nights, I heard you speak about it. You have this parallel going up and going down in addition to the yes. palindromes, which, um, as a casual re- reader, I didn't necessarily see it. And then yes. you spoke about it, and I went, oh, look at that. <laughs> this doesn't seem to have that same element to it. It's the, the basic substantive historical see, pieces yes. are a lot more complicated on their face but you give the information there you talk about you provide all the information about her Geniza program you can provide the information about Rambam and and his guide to the perplexed um it's the parallel structures there yes so deciding between how, how I decide right, between those right. two approaches. Yes. Um, I mean, I wish I could say that, like, I decided. <laughs> I mean, in a sense, like, the book decides for me. Um, one thing that I, I um, in, in approaching this, with the last book, I, I had this idea that I had written other books like this before that had sort of multiple storylines and were intersecting historical and contemporary. And with the third book, with the last book, I had made this decision that I was like, that that was a little bit of a crutch. Like, I felt like I didn't really know how to write a real plot. And so therefore, I would just like write a contemporary story. And then whenever I got stalled with that, I'd move on to a historical story. It was kind of like a way to move the story along. And then with the third book, I made this decision that I wasn't going to do that. And I wanted to write just one story all the way through. Um, with this book, it kind of, these other plot, these other plots sort of emerged Merge. But there is, um, and so yes, a lot of those complexities are there, are sort of explained on the surface. And that's truthfully because of the subject matter. I mean, I think like with the Civil War, I don't have to sit there and explain like, you know, the North was fighting the South and here's why. You know, I mean, like I can assume that American readers know that, although foreign readers don't, as I discovered when it was published overseas. Um, it's awkward. Um, but with this book, I, I, you know, you can't assume that people know anything about, you know, medieval Egypt. You can't assume that people know anything about, you know, Victorian explorations in, 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 in Egypt and those kinds of things. So I felt, in a sense, I, I had to explain a little bit more on the surface than I would. That said, there are sort of a lot of... Um, there are other patterns that are built into the book that may not obvi- be so obvious. The Joseph one, okay, and that's something that I think it's even mentioned in the jacket copy. So that's, you know, people that are told about that. But there are other aspects of that that are maybe not so obvious. Um, there's a story within the biblical story of Joseph about um, Judah and Tamar, which is about um, the Ju- Judah, who's one of Joseph's brothers, um, who ends up being seduced by his daughter-in-law um, in order to maintain a family line. It's kind of this sordid sexual tale, but it's, it's ostensibly about maintaining a family but is it really um, that seduction story is replicated in this book. And that's a story like, and I could have sat there and explained and had somebody read it about it from the Bible. And I didn't do that. I mean, I just felt like it's just there. And if people notice that they do, and if they don't, they don't, it doesn't really matter to me. It's still just part of the story. Um, also there's, you know, the, the kind of the parallelisms between the different um, there's, there's a lot of different echoes that uh, appear in each of the stories that are, you know, I think like the pattern on the cover of the book is very apt that it's like a story within a story within a story. So um, like there's a lot of points where there's the idea of a pit, um, where um, someone falls into a pit, whether it's a physical pit or a memory pit, um, you know, and, there's, and that's something that recurs throughout the book um, at different points where, and there's a question of whether that pit has a bottom, whether or not there's a way to get out of it. That's sort of a recurring item, a recurring scene that takes place throughout the book. Um, the sibling relationships is something that recurs throughout the book and that is maybe not so obvious when you first read it. Um, there, are other, there are other elements like that that, that repeat throughout the book. Um, and so, and and the question of sort of beginnings also, and how much of the you know how much we are controlled by what happens before we even got here, is something that appears throughout the book. But mostly, it was, I would say about the subject matter is that I felt that um, you know, there was there was sort of more that I had I, I had a little more work to do in terms of introducing the subject matter. But also, um, but I think that at the, at the same time, it's a much more universal. The story is a much more universal experience in a lot of ways because the core of the story is not about, you know, in it, the Civil War, it's like, you know, you're sort of stuck in this historical milieu. But it, here, this, this is a very timeless story, in a sense, because it's this eternal problem of what we remember from our own past, and how that past shapes our future, and how much we control over, how much control we have over the way that past appears in our own future. 